Let's go to the special sense organs. So we have millions of sense organs in the body, in the skin, internal organs, and muscles. They allow the body to respond to the environment around us. They sense organs give the body the ability to sense changes and to maintain homeostasis. We're also enabled to initiate reflexive or protective actions. The reflexive, the reflex arc happens when we put our hand on a hot surface. The sensory neurons recognize that we just touched something that's hot. It will send a message to our spinal cord, which will then relay it up to our brain, where we'll process that information, make a decision about it, and then we'll send a message back to our motor neurons in order to remove our hand from the hot surface. However, if the stimulus has enough um, strength to it, like let's say you put your hand on a, a stove top that's on, your body will jerk away before you feel the pain. What's happening? Those sensory neurons are sending the signal to your spinal cord. And when it gets to your spinal cord, your spinal cord recognizes, whoa, that's a lot. I don't even need the brain to tell me to remove that. And it will send it back to, this, to the motor neurons, back to your hand, and you'll pull it off. I'm sure you guys have experienced this before. You put your foot in like a hot bathtub or like in the hot shower or under a hot sink faucet and you pull it back and then you wait for that pain to kind of materialize. You can sense it coming. So the pain is still getting transferred to your brain, but your brain does not need to send the message back to remove it because that's already been handled by this reflex arc. This is a very helpful thing to protect us from things. This is also why we jump. This is why things like jump scares in horror movies are so effective because our body is still a biological creature, still thinking about the days when it needed to run from jaguars and people with knives and snakes and all those different things that used to kill us. This is why we're, most people don't like spiders, okay? And by most people, I mean all sane people. Most people don't like snakes. The reason for this isn't because snakes and spiders can't be nice creatures or cute even, whatever your, your, your thoughts are on that. It's because through most of human history, we learned that enough snakes and spiders are dangerous that we shouldn't get near any of them, all right? But we have different reactions to other animals. Dogs aren't poisonous. Cats aren't poisonous. Most of them, even though they can, even though more people are killed by dogs than are killed by spiders and snakes, we still trust dogs and we don't necessarily get scared of dogs. Although, honestly, we probably should. Dogs are aggressive animals. <clears throat> the sense organs are classified either as general or as special. General sense organs detect stimuli to indicate pain, pressure, or touch, widely distributed throughout the body. They all react to different things. Some are pain receptors, some are heat receptors, some are chemical receptors. We have tons of different nerve endings. Some of them help us to do things like feel vibrations or heat or pressure or other sensations. A lot of them are concentrated, as you might have guessed, in our most sensitive organs, our lips and our genitalia, because obviously those need to be very responsive in order for us to biologically pass on our material. There needs to be some sort of incentive for us to do these things. <clears throat> the general sense organs have certain characteristics. They have to change, they, sorry, they have to detect changes in the environment and then transmit that to the CNS. We interpret that signal and react to it in some way or another. <clears throat> All right. Skin has a lot of uh, pressure sensors that can detect touch. Some of them are very closely are placed together. For example, in our fingertips, the distance between those nerve endings is about two millimeters, whereas in our back, it's like 40 to 60 millimeters. There we go. So two to eight millimeters. In the back, they're six, 40 to 60 millimeters apart. If you guys have ever seen, like, had someone try to, like, draw letters on your back to spell out a word, and then you guess what letters they're spelling, it's very difficult. Some people have more sensitive backs, and they can feel this more accurately. Most people don't, because it's not necessary. 
We also have a lot of sensory grouping within our muscles. This helps us from over extracting or over contracting the muscles, right? Sometimes these can fail and then we get these muscle spasms. I'm sure you guys have happened where you get a muscle cramp. That's because the muscles are overstimulating and then they're, there's the calcium is being stuck in that system. And it's going to take a minute for it to come out, which is why when we get a muscle cramp, it's so much harder than normal because those muscles are over contracted. Now, going on to the eyeball. Eyeball, as you can imagine, is incredibly important. We have two of us, or sorry, we have two of them gives us that binocular vision. If you lose an eye or you close an eye, we lose a significant amount of our depth perception. We can still navigate, but it's difficult. The most functional, important unit of the eye, it's all important, but the way that we see things are through the rods and cones. So let me show you a picture of the eye and we can go over this. So the eyeball is like this. Now there's kind of a little lump on the front called the cornea. And this is where the sight is concentrated. So the main body of the eyeball is filled with a liquid called vitreous humor. The cornea, however, in the lens is filled with a different type of liquid called aqueous humor. It's a little more clear. This just helps us to concentrate light. Think about a camera, if you guys know anything about cameras. Cameras work by intaking light, photons, and then we concentrate them on a screen. So picture like an overhead projector. It's projecting onto a screen that you'd pull down. That screen is the retina. It sits in the back of the eye right in here. The retina is what's covered in the rods and cones. Your eye, the front of the eyeball here, there's a couple muscles that can contract and dilate to let in more or less light, depending on what we need. Those two muscles are called the iris and the pupil. Yes, the pupil is also a muscle. Both of those are muscles and they're both important. The iris is the colored portion of the eye. In almost all of us, it should be darker. In fact, it seems like throughout most of human history, most people had dark eyes because that's the most efficient way to do it. Why do we have so many people with blue and green eyes? Well, because the theory is because it was unique and so those people were prized and, and granted significant status. And then they were also more people wanted to mate with them. But blue eyes are not necessarily as strong as other colored eyes. In fact, if you have brown eyes or darker colored eyes, your eyes are probably stronger than if you have blue or green or gray eyes. The sclera is the white, sorry, the sclera is kind of the outer coating of the eye. And then the conjunctiva is this, also the outer coating as well. The sclera is, the, I guess, the white layer. It's kind of pigmented like that so that other light isn't coming in, messing with this overhead projector. All the light can be concentrated through here. The light comes in through the eyes, gets stimulates the rods and cones, and then it gathers that information and sends it through the optic nerve back into the brain. Everything you're seeing right now is actually happening in the back of your brain. You're not seeing with your eyes. Your eyes are just the way that light comes into the system. But technically speaking, the image that you're seeing when you look out into the world is entirely happening within the brain, not in your eyes. Kind of an interesting concept. Just the same way that you taste food, not with your tongue, but with your brain. You smell, not with your nose, but with your brain. Now, obviously your nose is important. It, it takes that stuff in, but that's not what's actually doing the interpretation of these senses. So the cornea lies over the iris. Iris is the colored part of the eye. Oops. The upper eyelid covers a little bit of the iris when the eye is open. The over, lower eyelid touches the edge of the iris, as you can see here. It's very rare that you should be able to see the entire body of this. If that's happening, we call that ex ophthalmos. Remember that when the eyes are bulging out. The lacrimal caruncle, I'm not sure why we talk about this, but that is this structure right here, right in there. This is important because this can become infected. 
We can also get styes, which are ingrown hairs on the eyelash. And then conjunctiva, which is also known as pink eye, or sorry, conjunctivitis. It's called pink eye. The conjunctiva is that membrane that covers the front of the eye as well as lines the eyelids. This is very contagious. In fact, remember I told you yesterday that the eyes are the number one portal for disease infection. The middle layer of the eye, the choroid is pigmented to concentrate light coming into the eye. The two muscles are the iris and the pupil. Again, so it comes in here, it's gathered on the retina, sent, it crosses, and then it goes into the optical centers of the brain in the occipital lobe where the image is being formed. So that image you're seeing is actually happening right in here. Now we know that our pupils will react to light in order to let more in. It's kind of like changing the aperture settings on a camera. In dim light, our eyes get bigger. In bright light, they get smaller. This is why when we wake up in the morning and we walk outside, we're always squinting because our eyes are used to a very dark environment and they're going to take a second to get back down to size. After a minute or two, they've constricted and you're fine. This also tells us a lot about the person's central nervous system. When you're getting ready to run from a jaguar, your pupils will dilate because you need to be able to see things more clearly. If you're getting ready to go to sleep, you'll go, your eyes will get smaller. So heroin will cause pinpoint pupils, methamphetamine, cocaine, stimulants, they'll cause dilated pupils. All right. Uh, this is important. Long time exposure to sunlight may cause the lens to lose transparency and become hard, leading to cataracts. Cataracts can form in one or both eye and they'll progressive. And if we don't correct them surgically, it will lead to blindness. As you can see, it darkens the lens, makes it more cloudy. So the light becomes more diffuse. Normally see, we've got a nice concentrated thing on the retina. This is becoming more diffuse, vision is going to go. This is what cataracts looks like, that cloudiness of the lens. Remember the lens is the thing filled with that aqueous humor, which is normally a very clear liquid. Innermost portion of the eye is the retina, the screen of, that the overhead projector is projecting on. This is where the rods and cones, doesn't matter which one is which. I think the rods are, are dim light, so they're better for making out shapes and edges of things. The cones help us to differentiate colors. We do have a blind spot in our eyes. Um, this is called, I can't remember what it's called. It has a name, but I can't remember what it's called. The center of our vision is called the fovea, which is where the most clear portion of our vision is concentrated. It's also the densest concentration of the rods and cones. So how does, how does it work? Well. Like I say, we have the fovea, which is the main concentration, right? If you stare at something across the room, you can read something, but you can't read two different things at once because we only have one relatively small area to focus on, right? Think about reading a book. You can only make out really a couple words at a time because the fovea is actually pretty small. So it doesn't seem like the rest of the world is blurry to us, but realistically it is. In fact, our bodies, our, our eyes are actually using a lot of tricks to fill in areas that we're, we actually can't see anything that's going on. We call these our blind spots. Even though we can technically still see things there, or we can make out shapes and colors, we're actually not seeing anything with any real clarity. Our brain is filling in the picture with what it knows is there with things it's seen and with what it's expecting based on colors and shapes around it. How do we know this? Well because the eyes can be tricked relatively easily. Have you guys ever looked at optical illusions? A book of optical illusions, I used to have one when I was a kid. They're really cool. Why do they work? Because our brain is not so good at differentiating reality from what it's actually seeing. It sometimes takes us a minute to figure things out and the eyes can be tricked and we can take advantage of that. You can lose an ophthalmoscope to look directly into the sur at the surface of the retina. And then this is what you can see. So this is the optic nerve. This is a normal optic nerve in a healthy eyeball, very circular. These are blood vessels going around in there. This is when diabetics 
have retinopathy. So you guys know that diabetes can cause blindness. How does that happen? It increases the pressure of the aqueous humor and it also increases the blood vessel. Because remember, there's a lot of sugar flowing through these bloods. And they're hardening the veins and it's going to make everything react less clearly. Notice how you can barely see the optic nerve. I think this is it right there. It's very cloudy. Vision is going to be affected significantly. So we talked about this. Light enters into the eyes. Those photoreceptor cells, the rods and cones, are stimulated on the retina. They send that message through the optic disc, to the optic nerve, travels, and results in the visual picture in our brain. So three things must be present. An image has to form on the retina, the rods and cones must be stimulated, and the impulse has to be conducted to the visual cortex. As you guys can imagine, Lots of things can go wrong with the eyes. I'm sure some of you guys probably wear glasses or corrective lenses. And this is usually caused by myopia or hyperopia, nearsightedness or farsightedness. And I always get these confused because I do not wear glasses. But my understanding is nearsightedness is when we can see close and we have trouble seeing things far away. And farsightedness is the other one. Sometimes this can be trained a little bit by focusing on something far away and then putting your finger up in front of your face and focusing on that and then focusing on the thing far away and then focusing on that. We also use these practices to help correct lazy eyes. A patient may not be able to focus due to something called a disconjugate gaze. Like I was saying before, we have this thing called binocular vision, meaning that we use two eyes to narrow in on a, on a target. Think about when you were in school and you were learning about predators and prey, how predators typically have the eyes on the front of their head because it helps us plan depth perception for hunting. Prey typically will have their eyes on either side of their head because it helps them keep a wider field of view to see things. Now their brains process that visual information differently. It would be very difficult for us to navigate the world if all of a sudden we had a disconjugate gaze. For example, can you cross your eyes? If you can, go ahead and cross your eyes. If you can't, you can do it by hold your finger out in front of you, look at it, concentrate on it, and then staring at it very carefully. Bring your finger closer and closer and closer until you can touch your nose. You now have your eyes crossed. Now, if I told you to close one eye and get up and go use the bathroom, you could probably do it no problem. If I told you to cross your eyes and then get up and go use the bathroom, you'd probably end up stubbing a toe. Our brains are not used to seeing things that way. Now, given time, they will adjust and we'll be able to make sense of the world, but it's gonna take a while for our brain to rewire. Here's an example of, sorry, the disconjugate gaze. He's looking in two directions at once. The brain does not like this. It has a very hard time understanding things. Um, conjunctivitis can cause permanent damage to the eye. Remember, this is pink eye. Retinal injuries or congenital detachment can cause serious visual disturbances and lead to permanent blindness in the eye. Retinal detachment may be caused by aging, trauma to the eye, or tumors. You can see that the retina is literally peeling off the back wall. Here you can see it peeling off of that lower edge there. And next is diabetic retinopathy. We talked a little bit about this. Diabetes causes hemorrhages from the small vessels within the eye, leading to buildup of intraocular pressure. More pressure is going to press on everything. which is going to lead to the photoreceptors, which are cells, meaning that they have a blood supply. Those rods and those cones, they also need blood, oxygen, and sugar in order to function. This is going to cause them to become ischemic, which is going to cause blindness. This is the leading cause of blindness in the United States, actually. Glaucoma is very similar to diabetic retinopathy, except that this is a buildup of that aqueous or that vitreous humor in the eye and the aqueous humor in the retina. And all of this is going to press up against the retina, again, causing ischemia. It can also cause the optic nerve to herniate out into the optic um, passageway there. You can see a tiny little bit of it squeezing into the optic nerve. Injury or disease does not have to occur in the eye to affect vision. Obviously, it can also affect, occur in the brain as well, or any area where the visual field is being represented. Strokes, head injuries, and tumors can all affect this. 
People with MS, remember that they're having neuronal changes in their myelin sheaths that help conduct impulses. This can also affect the optic nerve. And then they'll get something called a scotoma, which is a big black spot in the center of their vision. All injuries to the eye need to be evaluated by an ophthalmologist. We're talking about traumatic injuries, foreign bodies, corneal injuries, globe injuries, burns. Eyelid injuries should be carefully evaluated after ascertained if there's any orbital involvement. Orbits, remember, is the bone structures that house the eye. So if we lacerate the surface of the eye, it can be very deceptive and difficult to see. We need to control the bleeding with very slight pressure if you're certain that there's no bone involvement, right? Otherwise, we could be causing a lot more damage to the eye with the bones um, compromised. Cover both eyes and transport. It needs to be corrected within 24 hours. Here you can see an eye injury from some blunt trauma to the eye and some conjunctival injuries. While conjunctival hemorrhage looks very damaging, this actually is not very bad for the eye. Okay, what's happening is we're bleeding in the conjunctiva and in the choroid, which is the outer layers of the eye. You guys maybe have had this before where like you rub your eyes really hard and you burst a couple of blood vessels in the surface of your eyeball. That's not good, but your blood vessels burst all the time. They know that and they heal and your eyes will heal up. This might look really impressive, but realistically it's not gonna cause very much permanent damage to the eye. Foreign bodies can be minor or they could puncture the globe. Any item puncturing the globe should be stabilized and both eyes patched. I've never seen something quite like this in the field, but that's good because I'm kind of squeamish about eyeballs. Uh, it just hurts. A globe rupture is just what it sounds like. The globe of your eyeball is now rupturing and spilling out its inside contents. Look for loss of visual acuity. That should make sense. Irregular pupils, bleeding in the eye, hyphemas, and loss of vitreous or aqueous humors. We're going to talk about a hyphema. There's going to be a, a picture here in just a second. Burns to the eye, obviously, are also going to need an ophthalmologist to treat them. Be careful for an irrigating and do not contaminate the uninvolved eye if you've got like runoff. So chemical burns, firework burns, arc flash burns from, uh, I think the, I don't know, that's from, uh, from electricity and then from welding burns. So all those are incredibly painful looking. Hyphema, this is the thing we were talking about earlier. Collection of blood behind the lens of the eye. Torn blood vessels will fill the chamber behind the lens. They should be sitting up when the eye is evaluated since the blood will pool behind the iris when supine. A hyphema can lead to permanent blindness, patch both eyes, transport. You'll notice it's literally following gravity. They should be sitting up when they see blood in their eye like this. If they lay down, it's going to cover all of their eye completely occlude their vision and cause more damage. Blood is literally heavier than water, so it's going to sink. Or it should say it's heavier than the aqueous humor that's in the cornea. And a corneal abrasion, finally, this is the last one. I had one of these once and it was incredibly painful. I do not recommend them. Corneal abrasion is when the cornea uh, suffers a slight abrasion or a scraping. So this is going to cause a lot of pain for a long time. Um, it happened to me, I got something like a grain of sand or something in my eye and I rubbed it and I, I caused the corneal abrasion. And then it took a long time for it to stop hurting, like two or three days. And the only thing that helped was uh, these eye drops that would reduce the sensation. That was when I was like in third grade or fourth grade, I can't remember. Some people might have unusually shaped pupils. If they've had cataract surgery, they may be elliptical, teardrop, or keyhole shaped. Keep in mind, remember, the iris and the pupil are both muscles. Muscles can always malform in children. So sometimes kids can even be born with these interestingly shaped eyes. They're very rare, but it's actually usually caused by this chromosomal abnormality. Not always related to other chromosomal abnormalities, though. You can see some pictures of it here. So again, just that muscle of the iris has not closed up or the muscle of the pupil is not closed up correctly. Sometimes they'll have normal vision, sometimes they'll be blind. The, um, these unequal pupils can also happen 
normally the pupils should always be in line. They should be reacting together. We can cause unequal pupils by like opening one eye and shining a bright light in it. And so it constricts and then keep leaving the other eye shut. So it expands and then our eyes will be a little uneven, but they'll even out really quickly. If we get to the patient and their eyes are like this, expect some sort of head injury, unless they have a permanent um, effect like this, usually caused by some sort of stroke or something which impairs their ocular nerve. We can also have, and this is really strange, these weird odd pupils, double pupils or even double eyes. This is one of the more amazing things I've seen in this slideshow. Wait until you get to the birth defect slides though. Those are really cool too. I don't know if these people would have any real vision. It seems to me like this lady would have a better chance of seeing things than this one would. And I assume it's a lady just because of the mascara. All right, moving on to the ear. The eye is the most involved section of this. So that's the longest one. This ear is relatively simple because there's not nearly as many structures. In fact, I'm going to go straight to this one. So we have three portions, the external ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. External ear is literally the outside portion, which by the way, every little part of your ear has a name. But this outer area is called the auricle or the pinna. This is just used to funnel the sound in more efficiently. This is also the external ear until you get up to the tympanic membrane. So sound is funneled down this as vibrations. It vibrates the tympanic membrane. Then we have the middle ear, which is a small series of three bones, the stapes, incus, and malleus, and the eustachian tube. This drains back down to the oropharynx. This is how if we get water in our ears and it can't drain out through the ears, it should drain out through here. It doesn't always work though. So this is the middle ear. And then we have this structure right in here, the inner ear. This is, has two functions, balance and hearing. Balance is, uh, happens in these semicircular canals and hearing happens in the, con the cochlea. So all of this is filled <clears throat> with a liquid called endolymph. And what's important about this? Well, there's little tiny hairs in these semicircular canals. And if you look, all of these semicircular canals are at right angles. You can think of like an X, Y, and a Z axis. They're all kind of standing out at those angles. There's tiny little hairs on the inside of this that react to movement and based on the position of our head. This is why we can tell when we're upside down, right side up, or floating. This doesn't work so well for astronauts when they go into space. They feel like they're hanging upside down for like a day before they start to equalize and they realize what's going, their, brains, their brain makes changes. And then they'll also get this weird disequilibrium syndrome when they come back down to earth. They'll get like weird vertigo and things like that. But again, that'll, that'll normalize. Now, this is a condition of the outer ear called cauliflower ear. If, you, if you're at a bar and then someone comes up to you and is giving you a hard time and his ears look like this, you should probably not fight that person. This will happen a lot to boxers and people that wrestle a lot. I, I, I do jujitsu and uh, I have seen people that are really good and have done jujitsu for a long time, really competitively, and their ears are messed up and gross. This is a very common thing. There's some lacerated ears. Don't fight Mike Tyson. I read somewhere that Mike Tyson was gonna come back to boxing. That seems surprising to me. Uh, I. Like I could probably still punch. I don't think I'd want to get punched by Mike Tyson. When I think about people I don't want to get punched by, definitely put him on that list. So here's the tympanic membrane. So vib this is vibrated and this helps vibrate those bones that are connected to the inner ear. This can also become ruptured or inflamed. This is be an ear infection. Another word for that is otitis media. Here's the middle ear structures. It's these three little tiny bones, some of the smallest bones in the human body. Why do we have this three bone system? It doesn't seem like it makes, would make very much sense, but this is the way it is. These bones are called the ossicles, the malleus, the stapes, and the incus. They cover the, they touch the tympanic membrane and they touch this, the uh, inner ear, and then they send the vibrations along them into it. Sound waves cause the tympanic membrane to vibrate. 
This is transmitted through those ossicles and it moves through the middle ear. And then the stapes press against the oval window, causing movement of fluid in the inner ear. So they vibrate and the fluid moves around inside. Specialized mechanoreceptors for balance and equilibrium are located in the three semicircular canals of the vestibule. The three canals are at right angles to each other, like I was saying. This is to help us balance. So we can understand our position in space and the position of our head. There again, you can see right angles to all to each other. Finally, the cochlea and the vest and the receptors all link up to cranial nerves, <clears throat> the acoustic nerve, cranial nerve eight. Remember I told you there's 12 cranial nerves and a lot of them are associated with our senses. That'll pass into the central nervous system and enters the cerebral brain, the brain for interpretation. So again, we're hearing with our brains. So what can go wrong with this? Well, obviously a lot of people have progressive hearing loss due to old age. Conductive disorders are caused when sound waves are blocked. Usual causes blockage is the auditory canal, wax, foreign bodies, tumors. Osteosclerosis, which is osteons or bones, uh, that's the functional unit of bones, are inherited disorder that cause structural abnormalities of the stapes, including conduction disruption. Another common cause is viral or bacterial otitis. The eustachian tube connects the oral pharynx in the middle ear, forming a continuous membrane. Infections of the oral pharynx can migrate up to the ear and cause ear infections as well. Hearing loss in the elderly is called presbycusis. Progressive hearing loss caused by degeneration of nerve tissue in the vestibulocochlear nerve. Just happens due to old age. Obviously, the more we expose ourselves to loud volumes, the greater the chance that this is going to cause effects as well. Remember we talked about Meniere's disease earlier? how that causes vertigo and will cause eventually most patients to have progressive hearing loss. That's caused by too much endolymph, too much fluid within that, right? Too much pressure builds up will affect everything. All right. We're not going to go over taste. No, we'll go over taste because that's the last one. It's just a few slides. So taste, there are 10,000 taste buds. And this is a good one to end on before we take our lunch break, right? Let's end on taste. How about that makes sense to me? 10,000 taste buds on the sides of the tongue located in a larger structure called papillae. Some people have more taste buds than others. Women, on average, have more taste buds than men. Women taste things more efficiently than men do. Some people are what you call super tasters, meaning that they have 10 to 20 times as many taste buds as the average person. These are the people that can like eat some food and say, oh, is there cumin in this? Is there tarragon? Is that oregano? They can taste those things. Um, I'm dating someone who's a super taster. She's been a chef for years and years, and she can definitely taste every single ingredient in food. This is a good thing for if you're a chef and if you like food, which she does, but it can be also difficult because we also can taste things that we don't like in food. For example, I washed the dishes and I didn't wash, I guess I didn't rinse all of the soap off of one of the dishes. There was like a little bit of soap on the food and it ruined her entire dish because everything tasted like soap to her then. So it can have its positive elements, but it definitely has its negative sides as well. All tastes can be, can be tasted through the mouth and tongue, sweet, sour, bitter, and salty, but we've discovered, quote unquote, two other tastes, meaty and metallic. This meaty one is also called umami flavor or MSG. MSG is, is definitely like one of these enhancers of that umami flavor. Now, this whole map of the tastes on the tongue is not really, let's say, a thing. We taste all tastes on all portions of our tongue. We have the greatest concentration of taste buds on the outside of our tongue, that's true. And these areas of the tongue, well, they're just the areas what we, that we can taste them the most effectively. However, we can taste all the flavors in all areas of our tongues. Again, these travel in through the cranial nerve, um, the facial nerve, the same one that causes um, the uh, Bell's palsy. And then we taste in our brain. Black hairy tongue disease. This can be caused if you do too much dip or smoke tobacco. This is one of the way things that this can react. Literally, the little tiny hairs on our tongue will become longer and darker, almost looking like hairs on our head. It's really disgusting. 
So smell, there's one important concept I want you guys to consider before we go on with it, which is the sniffing position. The sniffing position is when we raise our heads up slightly in order to open up the nasopharynx and expose the scent glands that reside within the nostrils. How does this work? Well, it's important. We have, well, we've always learned about the head tilt chin lift as a way of opening up the airway and making it more patent. It's the same thing. Think about when you smell cookies cooking in the other room, you lift up your head to smell. That sniffing position is fairly common with all humans just because it puts us in a better position to smell things. Olfactory um, cells are the ones that receive chemo, small chemicals from the food. Remember that in order to smell something, parts of it have to break up and float out into the ambient environment. When you smell something, literally particles of it are entering your nose, including everything you smell, whether it's cookies or the sewage plant. We have about 5 million scent glands in our nose. And for the most part, they work pretty well. They're very sensitive, but they fatigue very quickly. We can't smell things for very long before we lose the ability to really dif differentiate fine differences in smell. The same is true for all mammals, including dogs. Dogs are famous for being, um, we use them for sniffing things, drugs, um, propellants, accelerants, things like that. Dogs can only smell for about 15 or 20 minutes before they need a couple hours to recuperate before their olfactory bulbs are ready to go again. So the actual use of drug sniffing dogs is more as a deterrent. <clears throat> and then they pull them out when they're suspicious, suspicious of certain things. After the cells are stimulated, the nervous impulses travel through the olfactory nerves into the olfactory bulb and enter the thalamic and olfactory centers of the brain where they are interpreted. These pathways are located closely to areas of the brain associated with emotion and long-term memories. Humans may retain vivid and long-lasting memories associated with particular smells or odors. Think about the smell of like your mom's perfume or your friend's house from that childhood, or if you've been around it, the smell of burning human flesh. These are very specific smells that you'll remember immediately. <clears throat> Now, the king of smellers are dogs. Humans have, like I said, about 5 million scent receptors. Dogs are known to have 225 million. Some, like bloodhounds, have over 300 million. Dogs are actually not the king of smellers, though. Dogs have really amazing noses. Does anybody want to guess which animals are actually the king of smellers? Which animal has the best nose? Pigs. Pigs are definitely as good as dogs in a lot of regards. We used to use pigs to sniff out landmines and truffles. Now we use dogs to sniff out truffles. Pigs are comparable to dogs. I'm not, I don't have an exact number, but they're around the same. It's not necessarily pigs, different animal. Any other guesses? Deer, I don't have numbers for deer, it's not deer. It's not rats, bigger, it's a bigger animal. It's a bigger animal, polar bear. Bears is the correct answer, yes. Bears have two billion scent receptors. I'm not sure which bear specifically, if it's brown bear, grizzly bear, black bear, whatever it might be. Probably all bears have a huge number of them, but bears have the most. Bears can smell their prey 18 miles away. They can smell fish through three feet of solid ice. They have some pretty damn powerful noses. What's also impressive is elephants. Elephants have 500 million scent receptors, but elephants have specialized scent receptors that can smell trace mineral contents in water. It behooves an elephant, an elephant to be able to smell water and then seek it out because they can go long periods of time without drinking. So elephants have better noses for smelling. Now I tried to find numbers on sharks because a shark is essentially just a killing machine that can smell like they say a drop of blood in a huge amount of water. That's not necessarily true, but sharks do have amazing noses. Unfortunately, I cannot find any information on the number of scent glands a shark has. I don't know if they use different types of scent glands. What I understand from them is that they're the similar to ours 
but they might be specialized because the transfer of smells in liquid environments is different than it is in air environment that we live in. So it's probably between sharks and bears for the who has the best nose out there. But dogs are the most common ones that we run into. They're all man eaters. Yeah, like I say, you're a lot more likely to be killed by a dog than you are by a shark. A lot more likely. You're more likely to get killed by a chair than you are by a shark. <laughs>